Welcome back to class. In the last part of chapter 12, I would like to talk about the Great Depression. It is mentioned here that uh, the examination of the Great Depression should take place on the basis of the results we gained from the ISLM model. Nevertheless, the uh, subchapter starts with an empirical analysis an empirical analysis of important macroeconomic variables over time. So in the first part uh, of this table, you can see the unemployment rate. Uh, we can see here in 1929 almost full employment. And then from 29 to 30, like the unemployment rate, rate uh, increased tremendously. So uh, this is uh, factor three, more or less, from 29 to 1930. But then you can see uh, that uh, the things uh, really get very worse in uh, 32, 33, where the unemployment rate skyrocketed at a level of 25%. In the next column, you can see the development of real GNP. So more or less like a measure of real GDP. Um, and uh, we can also see here that uh, real GDP decreased by about 50 units, which is a decrease of about 25%. Consumption also decreased, but when you compare the development of consumption with the development of investment, uh, you can get from this column here that investment reacted very, very much. So investment from the year 1929 to the year 1932, it dropped by almost 90%. So a tremendous drop in investment, which is of course like a goods market shock. Then we can see here in this column, what about government purchases? Uh, government purchases were like a pretty stable in the time period 1930, 31, 32. So not too much is going on with respect to government spending. It seems to be the case that during this time period, it was not the case that the government increased government spending. This would be like a main recommendation from the ISLM model. When you are in trouble, then increase government spending. But it is a case that the ISLM model is not invented. Keynes has not wrote like his book and Hicks has not developed the ISLM model at all. So the ISLM model does not exist in 1930. In the next uh, part of the table, we can see the nominal interest rates and the nominal interest rates decreased. This is one very important uh, phenomenon. The nominal interest rate decreased. We'll talk about that later on. Then we have in this column here, uh, money supply. And it seems to be the case that this is nominal money supply in column number four, because here in the last column, in column number seven, we have the real money balances, so real money supply in column number seven, while nominal money supply is in column four. And here we can also see a very interesting uh, um, fact that uh, nominal money supply decreased, like from uh, 26 to 19.9. So it is the case that nominal money supply decreased this is also completely against our intuition, which should recommend an expansionary monetary policy. Our price levels uh, decreased. So um, price level, of course, correspond with this column here, inflation. Inflation is negative. So uh, the US economy is experiencing a phase of severe deflation. Uh, goods prices decreased by about 10% in 31 and 32. 
These are important macroeconomic variables which really point into the direction that there is a severe recession going on. What is driving the recession? Let's have a look and sort the different sources into whether the shocks occur to the goods demand or whether shocks occur to money supply. Shocks to goods demand. First of all, we have to mention the stock market crash of 29, which is reducing wealth and of course impacts consumption. For example, here in our ISLM model, we can reduce the autonomous component of consumption. The IS curve would shift to the left and the economy ends up in a recession. We also have a, a drop in investment in housing. Uh, we have some failure of commercial banks. And when commercial banks do not give loans to companies, then the companies cannot invest. So uh, this crisis in the commercial banking sector also leads to lower investment and hence lower demand for investment goods, lower demand for goods. We can decrease here the autonomous component of investment. What about the government? How did they react? There is a Revenue Act of 1932 and the idea was to increase taxes. To increase taxes because of the fact that there is uh, a problem in the government budget. The government budget is in red ink, there is a government budget deficit, and the government is trying to close this gap by increasing taxes. But when the taxes increase, this of course leads to a shift of the IS curve to the left and makes the recession even more severe. And due to the fact that afterwards, there was still a government budget deficit. The government decreased government spending. And this will once more lead to a shift of the IS curve to the left, not to the right. Therefore, these government actions, they were pro-cyclical. They lead to even more severe recession. And that's completely against our intuition which we gained from the ISLM model. The big problem is that Keynes have, has not fixed his ideas. Um, the ISLM model wasn't there in 1932. Let's also talk about some shocks which arrive at the money market. We have seen that nominal money supply decreased by 25%. In 1929, Nominal money supply was at 26.6 uh, and in 1933 nominal money supply was at about 20. This is a 25% decrease. But does that shift the LM to the left? No, because of the fact that we have to look at real money supply. Real money supply is important and only changes in real money supply would shift the LM curve. But uh, when we look at the real money supply, the real money balances, then it's here the case that real money, money balances do not decrease from 29 to 1930 or to 31. So changes in real money balances cannot explain why the economy ends up in a recession. Like it's mentioned here, real money supply um, still increases at least from 29 to 31. So we have a drop in nominal money supply, but no drop in real money supply. Furthermore, we should also think about what happens if the LM curve would shift to the left. Uh, we have uh, analyzed that already on slide number nine. When the LM curve shifts to the left, because the real money supply decreases, it will lead to an increase in the interest rate. This is also something which we cannot uh, see in the data. We are not able to see it in the data because um, here on slide number 21, the interest rate is decreasing in this time period and not increasing. Therefore, like a first conclusion is that it seems to be the case that it it were some shocks to goods demand 
which uh, were uh, leading to this Great Depression and not so much shocks to money supply. At least it was not the case that real money supply decreased in the beginning. Let's talk a little bit more about the money hypothesis. Let's talk about the money hypothesis again. What are the effects of a decrease in the goods prices? There are some positive effects, which we'll talk about here in slide 29, uh, 24, and some negative effects, which we'll talk about on slide number 25. The positive effects. A decrease in the price level increases real money supply and would shift the LM curve to the right. So the, the decrease in goods prices should lead to an adjustment where the economy gets out of the recession and not into the recession. Then also there is this so-called Pigou effect. Lower prices increase the real value of money, which should stabilize consumption. Let's think about it. Let's say you have a $100 note in your pocket and the goods prices are equal to one, $1 for a bar of chocolate. So with a 100 US dollar note, it is possible that you can buy 100 bars of chocolate. But when the goods price decreases to the level of 50 US cents per bar of chocolate, then with your 100 US dollar note, you can buy 200 bars of chocolate. So the real value of money increases and this should stabilize consumption. What are the negative effects? Here we have to talk about debt deflation. The debt deflation theory. What is that all about? Here we have to put ourselves into uh, a company which has some debt. Also, let's talk about the chocolate company. The chocolate company has debt of 1,000, has a loan of 1,000 US dollar. And in the initial situation where the prices are equal to one US dollar, the chocolate company has to sell 1,000 chocolate bars so that the chocolate company can pay back the loan. But when the goods price decreases to the level of 50 cents, then the chocolate company suddenly has to sell 2,000 chocolate bars to pay back the loan. So when the goods price decreases, the company has to sell more to pay back the loan. And therefore, we have a relationship with respect to the real debt and deflation. A deflation increases the real value of debt and makes it uh, unlikely that the company can repay the debt. Since we are on a macro level, this happens to a lot of companies, not only to the chocolate company, but also to the candy company. Like on a macroeconomic level, all companies have problems to pay back their loans because of the fact that the goods prices decreases on a tremendous level. Furthermore, it's also mentioned that a decrease in prices leads to deflation expectations, and this increases the expected real interest rate. I have uh, mentioned here in equation one, the expected real interest rate, which is the difference between the nominal interest rate and the expected inflation rate. So in case that the expected inflation rate decreases, it leads to an increase in the real interest rate. And when we now argue that the investment function depends on the real interest rate, then it is a case that this shock here, like deflation expectations, lead to a higher real interest rate and therefore a lower level of investment. Uh, this is also um, uh, indicated in this graph where we talk about an expected deflation in the ISLM model in case that the managers expect that in the future the prices will decrease, then this will increase 
uh, the uh, expected real rate, it will lead to lower level of investment and therefore lower demand for investment goods. Lower demand for goods shifts the IS curve to the left or downwards and leads to a recession. The GDP level in situation two is smaller than the GDP level in situation one, and hence the unemployment rate increases. Let's briefly talk about the question, could the depression happen again? Here, like we have to um, see that it's the case that the government and also the central bank learned from the Great Depression and from the work of Keynes and Hicks. Today, it would be never the case that the Federal Reserve, the central bank of the US, would allow nominal money supply to decrease by 25%, as we have seen from 29 to 33. So the central bank would always try to implement an expansionary monetary policy and the central bank would try to inject liquidity into the system. Furthermore, today, only few economists would opt for a balanced government budget in times of massive unemployment. So in case that there is a government budget deficit, most of the economists would say, don't care about it too much. We have to increase government spending. We have to decrease taxes, even if this leads to an even larger government budget deficit. But it will also lead to a situation where the government can stabilize goods demand. And this seems to be important. This is one big lesson from the work of Keynes and the ISLM model, that when there is a recession with very high unemployment rates, the government should not care about the government budget deficit, but they, the government should care much more about stabilizing goods demand. And now we understand why, because of the fact that uh, we introduced here the ISLM model and we worked with this ISLM model and we're able to highlight what the effects are in case that the central bank increases money supply or the government increases government spending, decreases taxes. It will lead to a situation where goods demand can be stabilized and this will help the economy to get out of the recession. This is the end of chapter 12. So our last video, thank you very much for watching this video. Have a nice day. Bye bye.